This is Pastor Randy Tinker at Trenton Ministry Center. I want to thank you for watching our program today. At TMC, we believe that through Jesus, we can change our city and impact our world. I pray you are blessed by today's program. Thank you, praise team. Fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. It's becoming more evident to me, and it's not really my sermon this morning, but I want to take a second. It's becoming more evident to me, and probably to you as well, that Jesus is about to come back. <laughs> and if we're not careful, we'll forget that. We'll be caught up in the affairs of ourselves and the affairs of our lives and the things happening around us, and it steals the hope that we have. You know, the only hope you have, the hope you have as a Christian is for the Lord to come back. That's the only way this is going to be fixed. Man can't fix it. We're about to enter into a presidential race. That's all we're going to hear. It's already all we're hearing. I don't care who you vote for. It doesn't matter. They cannot fix it. Man cannot fix this mess. This world is in jeopardy. And our help does not come from man. But when the king comes back, <laughs> he'll set things in order. If I'm not careful, I'll preach that this morning. Let's go to the book of Romans. You're surprised, aren't you? The book of Romans, we're going to, was in chapter 6 last week. We're going to go back to chapter 6 today and finish up chapter 6, beginning with verse 15. Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 15. We're going to look today at this. Sin takes, God gives. Sin takes, God gives. Would you look at your neighbor and say, sin takes, God gives. Amen. Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to truth or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart from that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin... You are free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can somebody give thanks unto God for the word that was read this morning? <laughs> Father, take these words and apply them to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Give somebody a high five around you and you can sit down if you want. Amen. Lord, let truth reign in this house today. Sin takes from you, God gives to you. Sin brings forth death, God gives gives life. This is written, Paul wrote this word that I just read to you to Christians who were already delivered from sin. And they were delivered from sinful nature. And now Paul is coming back and he's admonishing these Christians, these believers in Christ. He comes back and he writes to them and he's admonishing them. And he basically what he said is, once you've been delivered from sin, don't do stupid things. Boy, we could go home right now, couldn't we, and say, wow, he really preached. <laughs> he says, once God has cleansed you and saved you, don't go back to the things that he delivered you from. He's saying, that stuff almost killed you. He was saying, you were a sinner when you'd done those things. And now that you're not a sinner, don't do the things that sinners do. He's saying, flee from these things. Get away from them. 
Paul is saying, say no to sin. He's saying, learn to obey God. In verses 16 and 17, he uses the word obey twice in verse 16. Verse 17, he uses it once, but he uses it in the past tense. He says, because we are now free from sin through the blood of Jesus, are we now free to pick up old actions we used to do when we were sinners? And then he comes behind and he says, certainly not. We can't do the things we used to do just because we've been saved. Now, there's some people, and there may be some in this room this morning that thinks, I've been saved, I'm saved, and now I can do what I really want because it don't matter. Boy, did I come to bust your bubble. You cannot remain in sin and call yourself born again. Listen to me now. If you're born again, I'm not saying you're perfect because you're not except through the blood. If you're born again, you'll do everything within your power to get away from it. Come on now, this is one of those sermons that's hard for the preacher to preach and we're just getting started. We're free from sin. Free from sin through the blood of Jesus. Now, you know if you come here, while I preach grace, and I do, while I preach and believe that when you come to Christ, you are forgiven. While I preach when you come to Christ in this flesh, you will still have hang-ups and you will still have struggles. But yet I preach those things and I believe those things. But I also believe that after you come to Christ, you must still flee temptation and sin and stop using the the, uh, phrase, I'm not perfect, as an excuse for you to continue in sin. Stop saying I can't help it. That's a lie. It's tied in here. Don't use that. In verse 16, Paul is saying, whoever you obey is your master. If you give in to your flesh, your flesh is your master. If you give in to sin, sin is your master. If you give in to God, God is your master. That's what Paul is laying out here. As a sinner, you had no choice because you do what sinners do. It's the sin nature. You can't help it because you're not born again. But, somebody say but, but when the Lord saved you, when He called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, when you put faith in His shed blood, when you said, Lord, save me, when you said, Lord, forgive me, you were transformed from a sinner to a saved person, and you were given the power of the Holy Spirit to help you walk away from sin. God did not save you just so you could go to heaven. No, when he saved you, he gave you a portion of the Holy Spirit to help you say, no, I don't live like that anymore. No, I'm not going back to those things that I used to do. He gave you the power to walk away, to say no, to obey the word of God, and to live in righteousness. Every day you have to make a choice. Am I going to live right or not? Somebody says, but pastor, I'm saved. I am too, but I have to make choices every day. Am I going to act like a Christian or not? Am I going to obey the word of God or am I not? It's a choice every single day of our lives. Every day. You had no choice when you were a sinner. Paul says, don't revert back to your old ways. And that always happens. We revert back to our old ways, Brother Ryan, when we don't pray, when we don't obey, when we don't study the Word of God, when we don't fellowship with other believers. We always begin to slip away. We find ourselves knowing better. And I will tell you, as a Christian... You will be more miserable when you sin than you were when you were a sinner. I want to say that again. As a Christian, as a believer in Jesus, when you sin, you will feel more miserable than you did when you did it not knowing better. You will feel miserable. You will feel guilty. You will feel grief. As a sinner, you didn't care what you did because there was no conviction. But as a Christian, you know better. 
As a Christian, I know better. And I know what's going to happen when I do it. You know how you're going to feel. I know how I'm going to feel because I have the power to say no, but I gave in anyway. But because I neglected prayer, because I'm not filling myself all the time, and because I let the flesh in, I let the old man in, and it started dictating to me how I was to live, even as a Christian. Your flesh will rise up, and it will start dictating your life if you're not careful. You didn't obey what you knew to obey because you wanted to set aside for a little bit and have a little bit of fun. You obeyed the flesh. Therefore, even as a Christian, it is possible to have your flesh dominate you. As a believer in Christ, it's possible to operate in the flesh. It happens all the time. There's nothing more miserable and I can speak this from experience. There's nothing more miserable than for a child of God to have a defeated devil and a destroyed flesh laugh in your face and say, I am still here. Now, in my responsibility as the lead pastor of this church, it's okay to preach here, isn't it? It's okay for me to share is, and I'm going to do it every week while I stop now. My responsibility as the lead pastor, as a shepherd of this church, with that responsibility, I'm just going to share with you this morning. I'm going to be transparent. Many times as your pastor, I'm heavy hearted. Sometimes I'm heartbroken. A lot of times I'm upset when I see what you are letting happen to you. You need to understand something about me as your pastor. I'm probably more concerned about you than you are yourself. I care more about what you're doing to yourself than you care about what you're doing to yourself. I'm just preaching how I feel. I'm not a speaker. I'm not a storyteller. I am not a poetry reader. I am not a life coach. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a motivational speaker, and I'm not an entertainer, but I am a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I proclaim the truth of the gospel, and sometimes it is in your face, and sometimes it is uncomfortable, but you've got to know something about me. I will not compromise it. Many of you think that I can preach a sermon, and I get to go home on Sunday and prop my feet up and say, that's over. I, now I want to do this again until next week. Not so. Let me tell you about myself. After I preach the way I do, when I go home, I wonder what I have said today that has offended somebody. I'm just preaching to you. And then I go home and I wonder, I wonder if they'll be back because of the way I preach. It's okay to preach to you, be honest with you, ain't it? But you got to know something. I, I didn't come to make you feel good. I didn't come to pump you up. If you're pumped up, hallelujah. But if you feel guilty after I preach, hallelujah. I come to preach the Word of God, and as long as there's breath in my body, I'm going to preach the Word of God. Sometimes you're going to shout with me. Sometimes you're going to have fried preacher for dinner. I know that when I got into this, but I refuse not to preach what this says based on how you feel about me. Oh, Jesus. You see, I have a calling on my life, and it's an uncomfortable calling. I'm not just a preacher. I'm a pastor. I'm a shepherd. And as such, this is not just a Sunday. This is not something that I do on Sunday. You've got to understand something that means you're a pastor. That burden that you carry, that thing that is hurting you, that thing that you're carrying, you may not know it, but I carry it with you. And I lose a lot of sleep at night thinking about you. That's why I preach the way I do, because I don't want you to live a defeated life. I don't want you to live with Satan beating you up. I don't want you to make wrong choices that you'll look back and wish you had not made. Yet more and more Christians, yes, even here, but Christianity as general, but even us, 
Many, many more Christians are yielding to the flesh instead of standing on the promises of God and obeying what they know to obey and doing what this book says. For some reason, there's a lot of people that think that they can just glide on in and make it. I've come by to tell you, you will not glide into heaven and you will not get by by the skin of your teeth. A person that gets to heaven is a person who says, no matter what's going on in my life, I am determined to make it. I shall not be moved. I will not give up. It may hurt. It may feel bad. But I am determined to hold out to the end. The king is coming. Well... That's why I preach the way I do. You see, because I'm a pastor, I deal with people. And on a weekly basis, I'm told of problems in marriages, problems in finances, problems with kids, problems with husbands, problems with wives, problems with jobs, problems with homosexuality, problems with drugs. That's what I deal with. And I'm tired of the devil stealing from you. And I'm tired of you giving it to him. You didn't even fight. You're just giving up. (laughs) Even in the church world, families are being torn apart. Little kids are becoming confused about mom and dad and why they're not together. Why am I staying here this week? Why am I staying there this week? I'll tell you something. In many of these cases, if you go back... In my experience, if you go back enough, you'll find a chat room. You'll find a text. You'll find a porno site. I'm preaching better than we're shouting. You see, by diddling on a computer, talking to faceless people you don't even know, and they're telling you and flattering you with words you want to hear because I'm not getting it at home. And the kids are stressing me out, and i got to have some kind of release. And you begin to think, wouldn't it be nice to know somebody like that? And sin gets his tentacles around you and begins to wrap you and draw you in. Preach, Pastor, I believe I will. And you keep that up and you're obeying the flesh. Come on, fellas, in your chat room's experience, it might not even be a woman you're talking to. That was just an extra. You have these things that we call iPhones and iPads. Yeah, I'm still on that. I'm preaching from one. And you're looking at pictures and videos. And I'm begging you this morning to get out of that chat room and that pornography site and remember that sin has never satisfied and that sin leads to death. Paul is talking to Christians who became less and less prayerful. Less and less faithful. Less and less studying the scriptures. Less and less attending church. Less and less being committed to God. Less and less being committed to the church. And they believe they're still okay. But they're not humbling themselves and staying strong in the spirit. They're reverting back to their old ways and doing things they did before they came to Christ. And say it out loud because they convinced themselves that God is okay with it. But they forgot how miserable it was. They forgot what pushed them to the cross to begin with. And then we start justifying the things that we do. Here's the problem. You can justify sin because you have a great helper. The flesh. You can justify it because of the flesh. It chimes in with you. It helps you justify it. Your flesh will justify it. Then the devil will help you justify it. He'll move in and will add to the justification. Before you know it, you keep coming to church. And because you have done these things, you sit and you think, I am so miserable. I feel so nasty. And you wonder how God can forgive you. And it becomes an ongoing battle even sitting in here. And you sit here and you think, I feel so awful. And I feel so guilty. Why do I keep doing this? And you just hope the praise team will sing a song that will make you cry. Y'all pray for me. 
Because crying kind of gives you a release, a relief. It's a temporary emotional venting. It, but let me tell you something about tears and crying. They can be deceptive. <laughs> I need y'all praying for me this morning. You see, we've been taught in the church that crying means there's a move of God. I've been taught that ain't right. What are you saying, Pastor? If I kept a journal, and I don't, if I kept a journal of how many times people have come down here and cried and wept, and I could even look and see wet places on the carpet, but they go back and they ain't changed one bit. Some people think, well, they got touched, they cried. No, they felt guilty and they cried. When you were a kid and you got caught, what did you do? You cried. I hope y'all come back next week. I'm here trying to help you. Don't leave here saying, it's all right, I cried this morning. I have people that get up out of these altars not many weeks ago and said, my life changed. I ain't seen them. You know what happened? You felt a little less guilty because you cried. Oh. What it boils down to is this. You're still giving permission to the flesh. You give in to flesh and it becomes your master. It controls you. It is stealing your joy. It's sucking your joy out of your life. It makes you contemplate leaving your family. It makes you contemplate getting a quick fix. It makes you contemplate doing something that pleases the flesh rather than something that pleases God. Listen to me. Dad and mom, on the day your baby was born, you was in that delivery room, you held that baby, and you cried. Mama, you cried. Daddy, you cried. You said, I'm going to be the best mama. You said, I'm going to be the best daddy. I'm going to live a good life. I'm going to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. But look at yourself now. Life happened. Let me tell you something. When you first get married, it's all joyful. It's wonderful. When you first have kids, it's all joyful. It's wonderful. And then life happens and kids grow up. Responsibilities increase. Your wife gains weight. You gain weight. And then you start looking at somebody else thinking they look better. Have you looked in the mirror? Oh, Jesus, that was fleshly, wasn't it? You revert back to the old ways and you start craving. Oh, I wish it was the way that it used to be. And you forget that you are on your way to hell then. I'm trying to keep it together. So then you think, well, I'll just leave until I get it together. See, that's the problem. You can't get it together. You don't know how to get it together. You ain't ever or will you ever get it together until you go back home, until you clean that side off of your phone, until you clean that side off of your iPad, till you get out of that chat room, till you change friends, till you hang around somebody, till you change everything. Because listen to me, nothing is, listen, 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 nothing is more important than your relationship to God, nothing. You don't love your family like you think you love your family if your relationship with God ain't where it needs to be. You need to move everything from your life that grieves the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say that again. Write it down if you want to. Put it on your refrigerator. You need to remove everything from your life that grieves the Holy Spirit. Everything. You can't play around. The king is coming. If you ain't careful, the king will come and you wonder why you didn't go. You can't play around. You have to be drastic. I believe in mercy, but when it comes to yourself, sometimes you got to be merciless. Do you remember last week when I brought up uh, Hebrews chapter 11? And uh, 
I talked about Moses and how he fled out of the palace to go be with God's people. Y'all remember me mentioning that? Let's go back there to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's go down to about verse 23, I believe. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. That a preach. By faith, he kept the Passover. Let's go to verse 26, I'm sorry. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. He said, there's something better than this. Everybody stare me down. There's something better. Better than this. Verse 26. What what does that mean? He meant the difficulties, the hard times, the trials. The hard times and trials that come with following Christ. It means the world is screaming, take this and, and take that. The affliction of Christ says, I can't do that. It means he valued what he had to go through with Jesus. Sometimes you have to value what you have to go through with Jesus. Sometimes you've got to look at the bigger picture and not the here and the now. This will pass. Anytime you're happy, it'll pass. (laughs) Can I get an amen from somebody? You can be happy and depressed all in the 24-hour day. This will pass. You better watch the decisions you make. You'll pay for them later. Faith in God helped him look past that moment of not being happy, not being fulfilled, not being gratified. What you got to do is you got to look past it and realize if you gratify, if you satisfy, Outside of Jesus Christ, you're going to be miserable eventually. And you're going to miss everything that Jesus Christ has for you because you didn't wait. Don't shout me down. Because you didn't wait, because you had to help, because you wanted it now, I want to be happy now. We forget that song, everybody will be happy over there. We ain't over there yet. But don't make decisions based on temporary circumstances. Don't make decisions that I want to do this now. What if God had something for you that would blow your mind, and he probably does, but you can't wait, and you nullify the plan of God in your life? you got to look past it. Moses looked past the pleasures in Egypt. Looked past the treasures. You know that stuff that you think that would make you happy? He had it. Moses had everything that he could possibly want. That stuff that you think if I just had, he had. Moses looked past all of that. And we say, oh, if I just had a million dollars. What could I do with it? I'll tell you what you'd do with it. Not a bit more than you're doing right now. You would spend it on foolish things, and you'd be broke before long. You would not give any more to the church than you're giving now. Ooh, that bounced back. How do you know that, Pastor? Because if you are not faithful in little things, you won't be faithful in much. What will I do if I have a million dollars? I'll tell you. You'll take care of yourself more than you will anybody else. Moses had it. Food, clothes, chariots, money, women if he wanted them, I'm sure. He said, I've had these things. 
but they left me feeling empty. I'm about to preach. He said, I think I'll wait on something else. I've had this, and it's not satisfying me. He chose to reap the benefits of waiting on God, serving God, and it paid off in the long run. Amen. If we don't get back to praying and reading and studying God's Word, we will not be able to look past the palace and see the reward that God has for every one of us. Sin will cost you consequences. God gives you rewards. It depends on how long you're willing to wait for something better. In verse 19, Paul says, I speak in human terms so that you will understand. In verse 19, he says, lawlessness, which is sin, leads to more lawlessness, which is sin. Folks, sin does not stop. It's a progression. Sin gets worse. You don't just commit one sin. You continue to commit more sins. Every person is drawn away from God by their own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when it is finished, when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Does anybody see a pattern there? Lust, sin, death. You can argue with me this morning all you want. Maybe you say, that's not how it works with me, Pastor. I am in control. If you are committing one sin... You're not in control. You've not given control of your life to God. That's why I got to have him. Anybody hearing me? That's why I got to have him or I will be out of control. In John 8, you know the woman, you know the story, the woman caught in adultery. In John chapter 8. We know what her sin was. It's, the Bible tells us. When Jesus gets up from the ground... You know, he stooped in the ground and he's riding in the dirt. Everybody wants to know, what was he riding? I'm going to ask if I can remember. But when he gets up from the dirt and he looks at the woman, he says, Woman, where are your accusers? And she said, None, Lord. He said, Are they gone? Then he said, Neither do I condemn you. And we stop right there. That's not where he stopped. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. We think Jesus was, we forget about that part. We think Jesus just stopped and was really nice to her. And I believe he probably was, but he didn't just say, I don't condemn you either and walk away. He made sure before she left, you were sinning. Sin got you where you're at right now. So before she left, he said, go and sin no more. He said, stop what you did. Don't go back to that lifestyle. I'm not condemning you, but I'm warning you. Don't go back. If you start what you were doing, you'll wind up right back where you were. Then, you see, I'm telling you this morning, you can come to church, you can get in the altar, you can have an experience with God, but unless you make some drastic changes in your life, you can hear God say, I don't condemn you. There is therefore now no condemnation. But don't go and sin no more, because if you do, you'll be right back where you started. Then John chapter 5, you know this story as well. Jesus goes and heals this crippled man. I believe the Bible tells us that he had been crippled for 38 years. He had been in that condition. And Jesus stands in front of him and says, Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made whole? And then Jesus says, Be healed. And don't sin anymore. See, we always rejoice because the man got healed. And we always stop where Jesus said, don't sin anymore. I don't know what kind of sin that man had, but I know he had sin in his life because Jesus said, don't do it no more. I have no idea what it was. I don't elaborate on that. But he did say, stop lest a worse thing come upon you. 
We rejoice in the healing, and we should. But Jesus didn't stop at the healing. He said, you better stop, or he'll be worse shaped than you're in right now. I, I, I got that this week. I read it, Rex, and maybe you think I'm misinterpreting Scripture, but I don't think I am. I, he, this man was doing something. Or Jesus wouldn't say, if you don't stop this, the worst thing's going to come up on you. This may not be comfortable, and you may not like it, and you may be mad at me. But God sent me here this morning to tell somebody, if you don't stop, the worst thing will come upon you. What was Jesus saying in this scripture? I believe he was saying, if after you've met me, and through negligence of walking with me, you turn back, it just gets worse. You think you were miserable then? You wait until you as a Christian walk in disobedience and let the flesh take over. And you'll do things even worse. I believe you're saying, you'll do the most unspeakable things that you didn't even think of. Brothers and sisters, sin is progressive and it gets worse and worse. It doesn't get better. If you ever give your flesh permission to do a tiny thing, you'll end up doing a great big thing. If you ever say to sin, it don't matter, you're in trouble. If you ever say this little bit won't hurt, you're in trouble. If you say nobody knows but me, you're in trouble. What is sin? We've changed it over the years. What I did last night in the football stadium when I was growing up was a sin. We changed it. Thank God we go to ball games now. Oh, can we have some fun and preach too? When I was growing up in the church, ladies, if you cut it, you're out. If you paint it, you're out. It must not be sin anymore because I've noticed some that said it was sin are doing it now. It never was sin to begin with. Come on. Come on. You see, we, we, we label sin. Then we, we, we think, well, maybe it wasn't. And then we just dive in. And there's no balance. We've changed it over the years. We've changed what we think sin is. You see, the problem is we used to and still do. We focus on the external and not the internal. Let me tell you something about sin. What is it? Sin is what I'm doing and thinking in here, and it comes out here. That's what sin is. Sin doesn't start out here. Sin is a progression in here. What is sin? It's living without the leadership of Jesus. It's living in disobedience to what you know is right. That's what sin is. What sin? James 4, 17. To him who knoweth to do good. Uh Uh-oh. And doeth it not. To him. It is sin. Period. If you're doing something you know is wrong, it's sin. Actions that leave you empty comes from sin. Deeds done in disobedience brings regrets. You've never done a righteous deed and felt empty. You've never done something good and felt guilty. You've never done the right thing and then regretted it. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and praise God, he adds no sorrow to it. 2 Corinthians said godly sorrow produces repentance as a Christian we are to still walk around with conviction in our life because there's always something that is luring us pulling at us there's always something that will make us an offer to make us feel guilty sorrowful dirty shameful so I am to live with conviction in my life you'll never be sad because you obey the scripture You'll never leave a prayer room feeling guilty 
if you really talk to Jesus. The secret to a Christian life, listen close, is to look past the pleasures of the moment and see the consequences and then choose the right thing and do it. If you continue to do what you're doing, what will happen is you'll convince yourself what you're doing is okay. And you can convince yourself that what you're doing is good, and then you'll wind up saying something. How can something that feels so good be wrong? Because you don't know what good is. The flesh is telling you it's good, and you're believing a lie. Because it's appealing and it's appetizing. And then you'll say, well, God's okay with this because God wants me to be happy anyway. Trenton Ministry Center. Jesus Christ did not shed his blood on a cross to make you happy. Pastor, does God want me to be sad all the time? No, he wants you to find your happiness in him. There is a difference in happiness and joy. The scripture didn't say, happiness is my strength. But it did say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Happiness is an emotion that changes on a dime. You'll be happy with one thing one minute and not happy with the same thing the next minute. Happiness goes up and down. But choice, regardless of what you're going through, you can have joy. Your world can be turned upside down and have the worst news ever. But the joy of the Lord that comes from Jesus and not from things and not from this world, the joy of the Lord will sustain you. Don't you look to somebody to make you happy. They're eventually going to fail you. Husband, don't put the pressure on your wife to make you happy. You're going to be upset. Wife, don't put the pressure on your husband to make you happy. You're going to be upset. I've got people in my congregations who have been married, some of them 51 years, some of them longer. And if they could testify, whoo, what a testimony they'd have. If I come up here and say they always made you happy, they're probably just going to take their seat. Am I, am I making sense this morning? Don't look to this world for happiness. And stop going around saying, I just want to be happy. If there is a Christian, it's okay to sit down, ain't it? I need to put a couch up here. If you find a Christian who's supposed to have a relationship with God and they're saying, I just want to be happy, I'll show you a Christian that's not been in the Word or on their knees. Don't come from this world. It can't happen. That same thing that makes you happy now will let you down eventually. But the joy of the Lord is my strength. Somebody give him praise. The only way God wants you to be happy is because you obeyed him. He wants you to have joy because you look past the pleasures of sin and say, I'll just wait because God has something better. Listen, I'm going to give you, you listen, nothing else I've said this morning. Listen to this. It's better to avoid temptation than to fight it. It's better to avoid temptation than to try and fight it. You won't win. 
Now I'm a pastor. Do you think that I'm going to let this stuff go on and not talk about it? Do you think I'm going to let the devil tear homes up without talking about it? Do you think I'm going to let the enemy trick you and trap you and overtake you and then laugh at you and me not talk about it? Not this pastor. I love you too much. I need to tell you, y'all better be careful, some people, all of us. Because if we're not careful, we'll walk into a trap that the enemy has laid out for you. And you'll walk right into it. Don't stay here this morning and think, well, I'll get out of it if it don't turn out the way I want it to. You may not before you lose everything you have and everybody. You know what? I grew up hearing the term, and still hear it, we need revival. We need revival in the church. What we really need is revival in your home. Because the church is just a reflection of your house. For each pastor. Well, pastor, we just need more word. I can't live with you. If you can't get any food through the week, you better find some spiritual food stamps. I can't be with you and give you the word. I told you this last week, and I'm going to tell you again. Don't blame the pastor and say, I'm not getting fed. Don't do that. I won't hear it no more. Uh -uh. I'm not your caretaker. You're not on a feeding machine. You need to be hooked up to a feeding machine. If you don't eat through the week, you'll be hungry. If you don't eat through the week, you'll fall. If you don't eat through the week, you'll fall to temptation. I'm preaching this morning. Praise Him. What I want you to do when I get through finished, y'all can come on. I want y'all to sing the King is coming, Trish. I want you to go back to that last verse, and I want you to sing it in realization of what you just heard this morning. Because I want to tell you, I'm asking us to shake ourselves this morning. You see, these are the last days. Jesus is coming back. I got to tell you, I believe in the rapture. Rose, I believe in the rapture. I believe in the coming of the Lord. And that's another reason I preach the way I do this morning. I believe that it could occur at any second. It's not a day to play around. It's not a day to have fun. It's not a day to relax. It's not a, ray, a, a day to roll around in temporary pleasure. It's a day to stand up straight and realize that God has given us the tools and the equipment to live the way that we ought to live and pray and seek Him and say no to sin and no to the devil and no to pleasure and no to the world and no to temptation and yes to Jesus. Stand with me. You need to know this morning, you are a slave to the one you obey. Some of you got to stop denying it and kidding because your relationship with God is suffering and you're out of balance and your life in Christ is anemic. Just a few moments, we're going to pray. And to some of you, what that means is, thank God now I can go, because they're going to pray. That way you don't have to worry about feeling conviction coming to the altar, because you're going to exit and pretend you have to go to the bathroom. I'm asking you this morning, unless you have to, don't leave. My prayer is, Robert, I remember growing up in the church when conviction would hit the church. It didn't just hit the center. It convicted people that were born again. And I pray, Ryan, that conviction falls in this place, that someone's driving in front of Fred, the conviction hits that far away. I pray if you 
or doing something you oughtn't to do. I pray conviction grips you and you feel so guilty. And when that altar call is given, I hope you burn a trail. Amen? Thank you for watching our program today. If you don't have a home church, we'd love for you to join us at TMC. Our service times are Sunday morning at 1030 and Wednesday evening discipleship classes at 7. Check us out on Facebook and you can hear today's sermon on iTunes. Please join us next week. And at Trenton Ministry Center, we believe TMC is the place to be.